Welcome to Prospective Doctors MCAT Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each week, Sam breaks down the highest yield MCAT topics so you can score as high as possible on test day. Hello and welcome to Prospective Doctors MCAT Basics with your host, Sam Smith. The goal of this podcast is to cover the highest yield topics on the MCAT and provide you with some sort of insight into the questions that the MCAT really likes to ask. This podcast is going to cover cell organelles, and I'm going to go through lots and lots of different organelles, I think something like 17 in total. And if you don't have a good cell biology background, like me for instance, then you'll probably find this podcast pretty helpful. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these different organelles, I'll talk about their name, their function, their location within the cell, and then tell kind of an interesting fact or an interesting story to kind of tie it together with some other topics in the MCAT and maybe help you remember it a little bit better. And this material is going to show up on one out of the four sections, which is going to be the bio-biochem section. And in terms of yield, I'd put this somewhere in like the medium yield category, like a, you know, like a 7 out of 10 or like a C plus. So it's not super high yield, but you're going to see a few problems. So I hope this podcast helps for those of you that don't really have a good background in this. And for those of you that do, you know, maybe take a listen and fill in the gaps that you're missing. And so the first thing I want to do before diving into all these cell organelles is define the term cell organelle for you. And in doing my research for this podcast, I came upon two kind of separate definitions. The first definition is that an organelle is, quote, a membrane-bound structure in a cell that serves a specialized function. But I'm choosing to use a more broad, inclusive definition that includes a non-membrane-bound structures. That includes things like ribosomes, flagella, nucleolus, and more. And so overall, I am defining a cellular organelle to be a specialized subunit within a cell that has a specific function, and it doesn't necessarily have to have a lipid membrane. Um, It can or it can't. It doesn't matter in my definition. And so as I said in the intro, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give the name of the organelle, I'll give give its function, its location within the cell, and then an interesting fact about that organelle, and hopefully I'll be able to tie that together to some other category that I've talked about in a previous podcast. So I've broken these organelles down into a few different categories, and I've broken them down based upon the organisms in which they show up in. So for instance, I'll start by introducing the cell organelles that show up in human plant and prokaryotic cells, so human plants and bacteria. Then I'll talk about the organelles that only show up in humans and plants, aka the eukaryotic cell organelles, as I'll call them. And then I'll talk about the organelles that show up in plants and bacteria. I'll then it go into the organelles that show up in humans and bacteria, and then the ones that are human only, plant only, uh, bacteria only, and so on. So in this episode, you will be getting a two for one. You'll be getting information of which organelles show up in which type of cells. And then you'll also be getting the information of what these organelles do, their structure, and so on. Um, So with that, let's get into these different cell organelles, starting with the ones that show up in human, plant, and bacterial cells. All right, so the organelles that show up in human, plant, and bacterial cells are ribosomes, vacuoles, the cytoskeleton, plasma membrane, the peroxisome, and the proteasome. So I'll start with the first, which is the ribosome. So the ribosome is hugely important to the function of all the cells in our bodies, the cells in plants, and also the cells in bacteria, or I guess bacteria are cells, so bacteria. Um, And their function is to translate mRNA into protein. Um, So they produce our proteins, and they are located in a few different places. First off, they can be located in the cytosol and are therefore called free ribosomes because they're just free floating around in the cytosol. Or number two, they can be attached to the membrane of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And that's what gives this endoplasmic reticulum its rough characteristic, right? It's studded with all these ribosomes. kind of looks like if you touched it, it'd be rough. And so... These ribosomes in general are called membrane-bound ribosomes because they are attached to this rough endoplasmic reticulum. 
In terms of their structure, they are a complex of protein and ribosomal RNA. And quick shout out to a professor at my undergrad, which is CU Boulder. His name is Dr. Check, and he won a Nobel Prize in chemistry for discovering that RNA could play this catalyzing role in the ribosome instead of just having this passive uh, function as being an information carrier in the form of mRNA or messenger RNA. And so further, the ribosome is made up of two subunits, one of which is a smaller subunit and a larger subunit, and they're categorized by their size relative to each other. Um, So for instance, bacteria will have 70S ribosomes, and Inside that 70S ribosome, you'll have a 50S subunit and a 30S subunit. The 30S is obviously a little bit smaller. The 50S is obviously a little bit bigger. And 30 plus 50 is not 70. I don't know why that uh, exists like it does. Kind of stupid to me. But just remember that bacteria, 70S ribosome, eukarya, on the other hand, have 80S ribosomes whose subunits are 60S and 40S for the big and the small, respectively. So to quickly summarize, ribosomes are made up of rRNA, ribosomal RNA, and protein, and are made up of two different subunits. In addition to that, uh, structurally, they have these three different sites that participate in the translation of mRNA to protein. The first site is called the A site, which accepts transfer RNA, which are these molecules that have triplet codons on one end, have an amino acid on the other end, um, and kind of act as an adapter molecule for translation. If you want to know more about that, go listen to the Central Dogma podcast. But further, they have another site called the P site, where the peptide bond is formed. And then they have a third site that is called the E site, where the tRNA exits. So that's kind of the general structure of a ribosome. And so interestingly enough, ribosomal function has actually been shown to be impaired in people with early-stage Alzheimer's disease compared to controls. So I was reading this paper that was published in 2005 by Ding and Associates, and what they did is they looked at the ribosomes in people with early-stage Alzheimer's versus people that didn't have Alzheimer's. And so, of course, they had to do brain tissue biopsies in order to look at tissue in the brain and look at these ribosomes that are in cells in the brain. And to do this, they had to use tissue from dead people. So then the question arises, can we extrapolate this information to living people? Well, in the paper they conclude, yes, you can. Of course, you can't do these actual experiments unless you're like a scientist in China that you know you have no rules and you can just take brain tissue from living people and there's no ethical guidelines. But my point is that ribosome dysfunction has been tied to Alzheimer's. Is there a cause and effect relationship? We don't really know, but kind of interesting to know that In early stage Alzheimer's, it looks like the ribosome function is somewhat impaired. Interesting. The next organelle I want to talk about is a vacuole. The function of a vacuole is to store different molecules that are important for the cell. This can be molecules like enzymes, it can be water, it can be ions, it can even be toxic molecules, like reactive oxygen species, for instance, ROS. And in plant cells, Um, They have a more specific function, and that is to help cells maintain their shape and rigidity by increasing the pressure within the cell. And oftentimes when you think of vacuoles, you think of plant cells, right? And that's what I do too. But um, don't forget that vacuoles are also found in some bacteria and some animal cells. And so in terms of their location, they are located in the cytosol of the cell. And structurally, they have a lipid bilayer that contains everything that's within in these vacuoles. And this lipid bilayer is pretty similar to the plasma membrane. And these vacuoles can be very variable in size. Typically in plant cells, they're larger just because they play that role of maintaining the cell shape. And I find it interesting that vacuoles play an important role in cell autophagy, which autophagy, if you don't know, is just this natural mechanism in cells that removes unnecessary or dysfunctional components and then recycles some of those components to other parts of the cell. And so basically, one of the functions that these vacuoles serve in autophagy is basically that when chloroplasts or mitochondria become damaged for whatever reason, they can be transported to the vacuole where they can be degraded by, say, enzymes. And then some of the proteins that make up these chloroplasts and these mitochondria can then be recycled and used again. 
for a new mitochondria or new chloroplasts. And so I should mention that lysosomes actually perform this function for human cells. Yeast, which are still eukaryotes, don't have these lysosomes. So instead, the vacuoles perform a similar function. So this autophagy thing that I was just talking about really only applies to yeast and plants, but still pretty interesting. All right, the next cell organelle I want to talk about is the cytoskeleton. And you might be like, huh? That's not an organelle. But based on my really kind of broad definition of components in a cell that serve a specific function, the cytoskeleton falls under that definition. So the cytoskeleton functions to give cells their shape and helps them maintain their shape during events of mechanical stress, like when they become deformed by some external force or pressure. You know, take for example, the tissue cells in your face that get deformed when you experience a punch to the face. It would not be fun if your cells could not regain their former shape and then you were just left with like a dent in your face. The cytoskeleton is also important for cell movement, intra and extracellular transport, and they're also important for cell division. Specifically, specifically, specifically when chromosomes segregate during mitosis. And in terms of the cytoskeleton's location within the cell, it's found in the cytoplasm. And in terms of its structure, and, and this part is the most important part for the MCAT, so li listen up close here. There's three different main types of protein fibers that make up the cytoskeleton. The first are called microfilaments. The second are called intermediate filaments. And the third are called microtubules. And each of these different proteins that make up the cytoskeleton have different structures. So I'm going to go through each of these structures individually. And I'll start with microfilaments, which are also sometimes called actin filaments. And so microfilaments are polymers of this protein called actin, which is a 42 kilodalton protein. And microfilaments function in the cell include cytokinesis, general cell motility, changes in cell shape, endocytosis, exocytosis, um, cell contractility, and mechanical stability. And so they're able to do these functions by being able to depolymerize and repolymerize on demand. And, you know, I kind of think of this like the classic, you know, nanotechnology of the future where you can create anything out of these really teeny units. So, you know, you imagine, okay, I want a car, and then I press a button and all these units assemble and now you have a car. Well, now I need a bed, so now I push another button and all these teeny little nanoparticles or whatever go and form a bed. And so anyways, in this same way, microfilaments can kind of take on different shapes by polymerizing and then depolymerizing. And this helps the cell in general motility and moving these vesicles in order to be exocytosed or endocytosed and so on. So a lot of this has to do with movement within the cell. So therefore, I associate microfilaments with cell movement. And so kind of a mnemonic or a way to remember this is that microfilaments can be abbreviated as MF. And when you see a fast-moving car on, say, the highway that comes and cuts you off, um, you, you might want to use a two-letter word that can be abbreviated as MF. So I kind of associate MF, fast-moving car, cell movement, which is a stretch, but hey, it helps me. The second type of protein filament that makes up the cytoskeleton is called an intermediate filament. And this is a family of proteins that share the following characteristics. They are made up of individual proteins that have a head region and a tail region. And then in between these two regions is an alpha helical rod domain. And so if you were to look at a picture of them, like I'm doing right now, they're these kind of long stringy proteins because they have a head region, a tail region, and then this long alpha helical stringy portion. So they're just these long stringy proteins especially in comparison to the actin proteins, which are this more globular shape or more circular shape. But anyways, these stringy or rod-shaped proteins are the individual monomers that make up intermediate filaments. And so what happens is that two of these proteins form coils around each other to form what is known as a protofilament. And this protofilament then is a protein dimer. And then these dimers all line up with each other to form the intermediate filament. And it's not really important to know this process of how all these align and everything. Just know that these rod-shaped individual monomer proteins form a dimer. Then these dimers join together to form intermediate filaments. 
And in terms of their structural role, intermediate filaments provide the cell with shape and support. And they are more permanent than microfilaments in that they cannot polymerize, then repolymerize, and so on to move things around in the cell. And a classic example of an intermediate filament is keratin. And of course, there's a ton of other ones. I think um, Desmin is one. Um, you could go Google like a big list of these and just read through it if you want. It's not important for the MCAT, but just kind of interesting. And in terms of a mnemonic to help you remember what the function of intermediate filaments are, um, you can abbreviate intermediate filaments as IMF, which is also the abbreviation for the International Monetary Fund, which essentially is this organization that helps support um, global monetary cooperation, helps countries secure their financial stability, etc. So essentially the IMF or the International Monetary Fund helps support other countries, whereas the IMF that is the intermediate filament helps support and provide shape and stability for a cell. The next and last type of protein that makes up the cytoskeleton is called the microtubule. And the microtubule is made up of tubulin proteins. And there's two different forms of tubulin. There's an alpha tubulin and a beta tubulin. And they form a dimer that then makes up microtubules. And microtubules are kind of what they sound like. They are these large hollow tubes. And by large, I mean comparatively large in comparison to intermediate filaments and the microfilaments. And microtubules play a bunch of different roles within the cell. For instance, they pull chromosomes apart, they add to the structural integrity of a cell, and especially help against compression forces. Uh, they let the cell kind of spring back to its original shape after it's been compressed. And of course, they provide tracks for motor proteins to walk along. I'm sure you've seen those creepy videos of the motor protein that's like walking along these different tracks in the cell. And it is kind of unsettling to know that something like that is going on within your body super fast all the time. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, you should right now go on YouTube and search kinesin protein walking on microtubule. And while you're watching it, just imagine yourself sitting at one of the ends of these microtubule tracks and watching that thing come straight at you. And tell me that that would not be scary as f***. And microtubules are kind of the easiest to remember, right? Because the name says it all. They're just these tube-looking structures that are a component of the cytoskeleton that can be walked along, I mean, sometimes participate in pulling chromosomes apart and adding to the structural integrity of the cell. And before I move on to the next cell organelle, I want to quickly mention that prokaryotes do not have intermediate filaments or microtubules. So that is only eukaryotic. And more specifically, intermediate filaments are only found in animal cells. So that is something to keep in mind here because I, because I threw cytoskeleton in the category of bacteria, plants, and animals. Um, but of course, there's a few of these filaments that don't fall within all those categories. So just keep that in mind. All right, the next organelle that I want to talk about in the category of animals, plants, and bacteria are the plasma membrane. Um, and the function of the plasma membrane is to separate the cell from its exterior and also to regulate what gets in and out of the cell. And the plasma membrane is important for cell signaling since it contains a lot of different receptors for that cell. And so in terms of its location, it is inside the cell wall in plants and some bacteria. Or in terms of animals, it is the exterior of the cell or the outermost layer of the cell. And in terms of its structure, it is formed from a phospholipid bilayer, which is made up of phospholipids, which again have this phosphate head, glycerol backbone, and then have two fatty acid tails coming off of it. And a quick and interesting fact for you is that HIV viruses use cell receptors on the CD4 T cell, which is the helper T cell, in order to enter the cell. And so the HIV virus has a capsid that is surrounded by a lipid membrane. And in this lipid membrane, there's a set of glycoproteins. And one of these glycoproteins is called glycoprotein 120 or GP120. And this glycoprotein helps the virus bind to the CD4 receptor that is present on the surface of CD4 positive or um, helper T cells. And then once this virus binds that CD4 receptor, it then binds its co-receptor. And a virus can either have a, and the HIV virus can either have a CCR5 co-receptor or CXCR4 co-receptor. And typically these viruses prefer one receptor or the other. And then what happens once the virus binds to its co-receptor, 
is then the viral membrane fuses with the cell membrane and the virus is released into the cell where it obviously can integrate into the host genome and then replicate and cause a lot of problems, especially cause damage to the immune system as these CD4 helper T cells play an important role in the immune system. All right, so the last two cell organelles I want to talk about in this section are the peroxisome and the proteasome. So let's start with the peroxisome. So in terms of its functionality, it is a membrane-bound organelle that contains enzymes that are involved in a variety of metabolic reactions, including several that deal with energy metabolism. And the peroxisome can contain more than 50 enzymes, and these enzymes can be involved in lipid synthesis and oxidation, cholesterol synthesis, and plasminogen synthesis, among other things. And in terms of its location, peroxisomes are typically found in the cytosol um, near the mitochondria, which makes sense, right, because it's involved in metabolic processes. And in terms of its structure, it is basically this lipid bilayer uh, membrane that contains enzymes that are involved in different processes, as I said. And an interesting fact about the peroxisome, and this comes from a textbook called The Cell, A Molecular Approach, and so it's legit. And this textbook says that although peroxisomes do not contain their own genomes, they are similar to mitochondria and chloroplasts in that they replicate by division. And when I was reading that, I was like, what the hell does that even mean? And basically it means that the peroxisome can get bigger and bigger until it splits off and becomes two different peroxisomes. And that's kind of weird, especially considering that it doesn't have any genetic material. So how does it know how to do this and what regulates it? So um, kind of interesting. Last but not least, in the category of cell organelles in animal, plant, and bacterial cells is the proteasome. The function of the proteasome is to degrade proteins that are damaged and no longer needed by the cell. And it especially is good at degrading proteins that are tagged by ubiquitin, which if you remember from biochem or whatever class it was, ubiquitin is just a signal that tells the cell, hi, please degrade me, sincerely, protein. In other words, it tags a specific protein for degradation in the proteasome. And in terms of its location, the proteasome is found in the cytosol and in the nucleus. And in terms of its structure, it's basically a big protein with a bunch of subunits. Um, so it's not a membrane-bound organelle, which remember, based on my definition, I'm including things that aren't necessarily membrane-bound. So again, it's a big protein, no membrane around it. And an interesting fact about the proteasome is that it plays an important role in the adaptive immune system by breaking down intracellular pathogen proteins so that they can be complexed with MHC class 1 molecules and shown on the surface of cells. And cells that are displaying this MHC class 1 antigen complex are then killed by cytotoxic CD8 T cells, which in the earlier example I talked about CD4 T cells, those are helper T cells. CD8 T cells are cytotoxic T cells that like to kill other T cells. They don't help, they kill which I guess is helping. All right, let's move on now to cell organelles that show up in eukaryotes only. All right, so there are a few cell organelles that show up strictly in eukaryotes. The first of which is the nucleus, then the nucleolus, then the endoplasmic reticulum, both smooth and rough, the Golgi apparatus, and the lysosome. Let's start this off by talking about the nucleus, which is a very important part of the cell, still not my favorite part of the cell, and um, we'll get to that later, but a little hint, it's the mitochondria. And so the function of the nucleus is to contain the genomic DNA, which codes for the proteins that are in our body. More importantly, it gives us an extra level of gene expression by regulating the segregation of transcription, which is DNA to mRNA, from translation, which is mRNA to protein. In other words, mRNA transcripts are modified before they exit the nucleus and go out into the cytoplasm. And this gives our cells more control over gene expression than things like bacteria that don't have a nucleus. In terms of its location, the nucleus is typically found at the center of the cell in the cytoplasm. Of course, cells are very heterogeneous, though, so I'm sure there's exceptions where you have nucleus that are like near the 
uh, edge of the cell, maybe up against the plasma membrane. I don't really know. And in terms of its structure, the nucleus has a nuclear envelope, which contains these little pores that lets mRNA kind of float out into the cytosol in order to reach ribosomes, which I talked about earlier, um, in order to produce full proteins. And at the center of the nucleus is what's called the nucleolus, and that's the next thing I'm going to talk about, so just wait for that. Thanks for checking out the Prospective Doctor MCAT Basics podcast. Sam's doing a killer job taking you through the most important MCAT topics, but what if you need a little extra help? How does a 5, 10, or even 15 point increase in your score sound? Imagine how your chances at admission could increase. Med school coaches MCAT tutoring can get you there. With the most rigorous selection process of any tutoring company, we see amazing results. We deconstruct each student, find a plan that is going to work, and help execute it. That's why our students add an average 12 points to their score. Completely physician-run and operated, and focusing on nothing but medicine. It's no wonder over 10,000 past students have trusted Med School Coach to get them through the MCAT and into medical school. Check out medschoolcoach.com today and mention code PODCAST for 5% off. And an interesting fact about the nucleus is that it contains 23 chromosomes that are big, long, linear pieces of DNA. And it blows my mind that you can fit all of that DNA into the nucleus. For instance, take chromosome 10 alone. It contains about 133 million base pairs. That's 133 million A's and C's and T's and G's, all in a single linear chain. Think about how crazy it is that just that chromosome alone, chromosome 10, can fit all that into this little teeny, teeny space. And it does this by winding up this DNA around histone proteins, which is a topic for another podcast, but I just find it wild that we can fit so much material into this little teeny nucleus. And before I move on to the nucleolus, I quickly want to talk about how the nucleus participates in gene expression. So first of all, splicing, 5 prime G capping, and addition of a 3 prime poly A tail to an mRNA all happen within the nucleus. In addition to this, the nucleus kind of creates a barrier around the genomic DNA that segregates, say, transcription factors away from that DNA so that you're not always having all the transcription factors within the cell binding to the DNA, right? So you might have, for instance, some pathway set off in the cell that recruits actively transcription factors to the genomic DNA through the nucleus. And so if you weren't to have this nuclear envelope around the DNA, then you just have all of these transcription factors coming in at all times, and you kind of get all wacky with the gene expression. You have no way to control the transcription factors that get into the um, DNA. But the nucleus actually allows this to happen and therefore helps regulate gene expression. The next organelle that shows up in eukaryotes only is called the nucleolus. And I just talked about that a little bit. Um, It's typically found inside the nucleus in the middle, and it functions to produce ribosomes. It is where ribosomal RNA transcription happens. It is also where pre-RNA processing and ribosome subunit assembly happens. So really the function of the nucleolus, summed up in one word, is ribosome production which it just goes to show you how important ribosomes are in the cell, right? It's got its own little factory within the nucleus to produce ribosomes, so very important. And again, the location is in the nucleus. And in terms of its structure, the nucleolus is this kind of dynamic moving structure that assembles around clusters of ribosomal RNA gene repeats. And this is not a membrane-bound organelle, so it doesn't have a membrane. And so you can kind of imagine these as like movable factories where you just pick it up and put it right on the ribosomal RNA gene, and then it just starts whipping out all these ribosomes. And obviously ribosomes are important, and we need a ton of ribosomes in our cell to be able to produce all the proteins and enzymes we need. So the ribosomal genes in the human genome repeat a bunch. As I said, you have the nucleolus that goes and surrounds these gene repeats in the genomic DNA. And so, for example, there are approximately 74 repeats of one specific ribosomal RNA gene in the human genome. So it's a bunch, just boom, 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 back to back to back to back to back. Shout out Drake. Um, And to make matters worse, 
there is a very high turnover rate for newly synthesized ribosomes. So they have a half-life of only a few hours once they've been newly synthesized. And so cells need to be producing ribosomes basically at all the time because you're losing them and because you need a lot of proteins. And hence, there is a massive number of gene repeats of all of the ribosomal RNA genes. The next set of organelles I want to talk about in this section are the different endoplasmic reticulums. So we have the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And from now on, I'm just going to say smooth ER and rough ER because it's kind of an annoying word to say. And so the rough ER is where I'll start. And the function of the rough ER is, number one, to produce proteins, but to also fold proteins and do a little bit of protein quality control. And it's called the rough ER because it is studded with ribosomes. And again, ribosomes are these little things that make proteins, and therefore that makes sense, right? If you have a bunch of ribosomes on this ER, it's going to be most likely involved in protein synthesis. What's more interesting to me is the two other functions that the rough ER serves, which is in protein folding and protein quality control. So the rough ER has what's known as an ER lumen, which basically means the inside of a membrane. So it's this membrane-bound structure. Then inside of the membrane is what's known as the lumen. And inside of the lumen of the rough ER, there are what's known as chaperone proteins. And these chaperone proteins, you've probably heard of, help proteins fold correctly. So what happens is you produce these proteins on the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum in the ribosome, and then you ship that inside the ER, where then chaperone proteins help it fold correctly. And in terms of quality control, basically what happens is that proteins that are either misfolded or unassembled are tagged for degradation in the rough ER by a ubiquitin tag. And that should sound familiar because a ubiquitin tag says, please degrade me to the proteasome. So then this protein that is misfolded or unassembled is then retrotranslocated to the cytosol, where then it is degraded by a proteasome. So essentially the rough ER tags shitty proteins and sends them off to the proteasome. And in terms of its location, the rough ER is right outside of the nucleus and is actually contiguous with the nuclear envelope, which it makes sense again, right? Because it has these ribosomes that are studded all over its surface. Well, how do you make proteins? Well, you make it from mRNA. And where does mRNA come from? Well, it comes from the nucleus. So those two need to be kind of close to each other to start producing these proteins. In terms of its structure, it has what are known as cisternae which are flattened sacs. Um, I recommend just going and looking up a picture of the rough ER. It's kind of like these disc-shaped pieces that are surrounded by a membrane. And then inside of these cisternae are what is known as the lumen, or the intercisterna space. And this is the space inside of these flat disc's membranes. And again, this is where a lot of the protein quality check and protein folding processes take place is inside of these membranes in the lumen. And interestingly enough, I was reading this paper about prions and the relation to the rough ER. And essentially the paper was saying that there's a theory out there that prions cause stress to the ER because you have all this unfolded protein. And a little bit of background, prions are these unfolded proteins that essentially can cause other proteins to become unfolded like themselves, which then can form these big protein aggregates and can be actually deadly, especially if it forms in the brain. And so essentially what this paper was saying is that these proteins that are unfolded um, are in the rough ER, and typically what happens is they will either get tagged with ubiquitin, sent to the proteasome, or they'll get refolded. But when there's some kind of prion, it's causing all these proteins to become unfolded, and therefore the ER kind of gets overloaded and starts to get stressed, and this sends a signal out to the cell that says, hey, something with our rough ER is messed up here, you should just die. So it causes the cell to actually die because there's a bunch of stress in the rough ER, and this is one of the theories as to why prions are so deadly, because they cause uh, cell death. And when you have cell death in the brain, that's not good. All right, so that is the rough ER. Let's talk now about the smooth ER. 
So the smooth ER, in contrast to the rough ER, lacks ribosomes. So therefore, it doesn't really synthesize proteins. Instead, what it does is it synthesizes lipids, phospholipids, and steroids, which are basically all these hydrocarbon-based molecules. In addition to that, it helps in the metabolism of carbohydrates and also detoxifies the cell. And in terms of detoxifying the cell, this primarily happens in cells in the liver. They express a lot more smooth ER than other cells in the body, and that is because the liver helps detoxify the blood. And in terms of its location, it's typically found outside the nucleus, like the rough ER, except for that the smooth ER is typically found more towards the periphery of the cell. So you can kind of think the rough ER found near the nucleus because it's involved in protein synthesis. The smooth ER is located further out towards the edges of the cell. And in terms of its structure, it's a bit more tubular looking than the rough ER. The rough ER kind of has this disc-shaped membranes, again called cisternae. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I don't really care. But the smooth ER is more like tube-shaped instead of disc-shaped. And again, go look at pictures of these things if you really kind of want to see the difference. And one thing I found interesting about smooth ER is that it's found in a lot smaller amounts than rough ER in most cells. So in most cells, you have a lot more of this rough ER than smooth ER. However, there's certain cell types like hepatocytes in the liver, for instance, that need a bunch of this smooth ER in order to detoxify the blood and produce uh, lipoproteins um, in the case of this liver cell. And so they will express a lot of this smooth ER throughout the cell. So, you know, different cell types can be very different. I've used this word a lot, but they can be very heterogeneous in terms of the amount of smooth ER that they have. Kind of interesting. The next organelle that I want to talk about is called the Golgi apparatus, also called the Golgi body or the Golgi. And the Golgi functions to traffic different molecules throughout the cell. So essentially the Golgi receives proteins, um, lipids, and other molecules from different parts in the cell, proteins specifically from the endoplasmic reticulum, and then it tags those molecules and sends them to their destination within the cell. One of the most common ways that proteins are tagged is through a process known as glycosylation, where essentially different sugars are added to proteins to give them a location tag. So, you know, a certain pattern of sugars tells the cell to send a protein to, say, the plasma membrane. And in terms of its location, the Golgi is located in the cytoplasm near the rough ER, so it's kind of close to the nucleus a little bit. And in terms of its structure, it is disc-shaped, sort of like the rough ER, but without ribosomes. So, you know, maybe like a soft ER would be something to call it. And the Golgi has two different faces. It has a cis face and a trans face. Incoming vesicles, say from the rough ER carrying proteins, enter into the cis face of the Golgi. And then processing takes place within the Golgi. You know, say you add some sugars to this protein. And then vesicles will bud off from the trans face of the Golgi and then they'll go to wherever they're supposed to in the cell. So you can remember that is the cis face's entry, trans face's exit of the Golgi. And one thing that's kind of interesting about the Golgi is that in plant cells, Golgi apparatus has the additional task of serving as the site where complex polysaccharides of the cell wall are synthesized. Kind of interesting. So the last organelle that I'm going to talk about that is unique to eukaryotes is what's called the lysosome. And the lysosome functions to break down biomolecules like peptides, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, um, lipids, and other things that are floating around in the cell that are important. And they break those down into its monomer units. So take, for example, DNA. Let's say you have DNA floating around in the cytoplasm for whatever reason. It makes its way into the lysosome for degradation. Well, it's going to be broken down into its monomer units, which are DNTPs or deoxyribonucleotide triphosphates. And those are the A's, the T's, the C's, and the G's that make up DNA. And lysosomes are located all over the cytoplasm because you're always going to have molecules that you need to break down. And in terms of their structure, they are membrane-bound organelles. So essentially, you have a lipid bilayer um, that surrounds a bunch of enzymes that are inside the lysosome. 
And obviously, you have to have some kind of lipid layer surrounding these enzymes because if you release them into the cell, it's going to do a lot of damage. You're going to start breaking down DNA maybe in the nucleus, which is bad. You start breaking down proteins in the cell that are serving some purpose. So it's just, it's like this little floating bomb. You know, you have what's essentially like TNT inside of it, and it's contained within this lipid bilayer. And so again, the lysosome really serves the purpose of breaking down biomolecules that are floating around in the cell. Most typically, this is going to be peptides, nucleic acids, and carbohydrates, as well as fats, um, which are lipids. However, everyone kind of always thinks of the lysosome as this, or as having this garbage compactor type function, and including me. But apparently that's not so. It, it doesn't just do that. It does a lot more. And so there's a paper published in Nature. The title of this paper is The Lysosome as a Cellular Center for Signaling, Metabolism, and Quality Control. And it's a review paper that talks about all the other less known roles of the lysosome. So yes, the lysosome acts to break down biomolecules in the cell, but it also does a lot of important things. For instance, Lysosomes are known to interface physically and functionally with other organelles like the endoplasmic reticulum. In addition to this, lysosomes are an important regulator of cell autophagy, which I talked about a little bit earlier, but uh, it's just this process by which the cell degrades these old components of the cell, you know, old proteins that have been around for too long, old mitochondria, etc. It just gets rid of them and recycles some of the material proteins and stuff that make those up. So moral of the story is that lysosomes do a lot more than just degrade biomolecules within the cell. And so that takes us now to the organelle that plants and bacteria share. And that's going to be one organelle that I want to talk about. So quick verbal meme the meme with the white hand and the black hand and they're, they're meeting in the middle. One hand is going to be bacteria. One hand is plants and in the middle is the cell wall. And so the function of the cell wall is to provide cells with support, protection, and it also participates in cell-to-cell -cell communication, mostly in plant cells, which is something I never really considered. So the outermost part of a plant cell is obviously the cell wall. So that part of the cell has to participate in cell-to-cell -cell communication. It's not like human cells, um, which is kind of easier to think of because we all know the different examples there of cell-to-cell -cell communication. But it's not like these animal cells where you have plasma membranes and you can have um, you know, gap junctions or whatever between these cells. So kind of interesting. And now the location of the cell wall depends upon whether we're talking about plants or bacteria. So first, let's talk about plants. For plants, this is easy. The cell wall is located outside of the plasma membrane and is the outermost part of the cell. However, if we're talking about bacteria, it gets a little bit more complicated. So you can have what is known as gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. For gram-negative bacteria, the cell wall is actually inside of a plasma membrane. However, for a gram-positive bacteria, the cell wall is the outermost part of the cell. And so it's called gram-negative because it cannot be stained with gram dye. And it can't be stained with gram dye because this dye cannot go through this outer membrane and reach the cell wall that is rich with peptidoglycan that is able to absorb that dye. But all you really got to remember is that gram-negative bacteria have an outer membrane that is outside of the cell wall, whereas gram-positive bacteria only have a cell wall as the outermost layer. And structurally speaking, the cell wall of plants versus the cell wall of bacteria are both a little bit different. Plant cell walls are mostly made up of cellulose, hemicellulose, and pectin, which are all polysaccharides. And then they're also made up of a small amount of structural proteins. About 1% to 5% of a cell wall is structural proteins. Bacterial cell walls, on the other hand, are made up of peptidoglycan, which is a polymer whose monomers, which are the smallest repeat units that make up that polymer, are made up of two joined amino sugars, the first of which is known as N-acetylglucosamine, or NAG, and N-acetylmuramic acid, which is known as NAM. So you got NAG and you got NAM, 
And when you join them together, they form the monomers that make up peptidoglycan. And so interesting fact about plant cell walls. Um, so humans don't have the enzymes to metabolize cellulose, which again is the main component of the plant cell wall. So it's considered a dietary fiber. And a dietary fiber is some kind of plant material that we cannot fully break down to metabolize. And if you didn't know what dietary fiber was, now you do. And so you probably heard growing up from your mom or your dad, you know, you got to eat your fiber, fiber is important. And why is that? Well, one of the effects that dietary fiber has is that it actually feeds the bacteria of the gut. So as the dietary fiber passes through our gut, some of these bacteria are actually able to ferment that cellulose and use it as an energy source. And so they can produce ATP because they have you know, the enzymes that are able to metabolize that cellulose. And during that process, the bacteria can sometimes release substrates that are useful for us. So for instance, some bacteria can release what's known as short-chain fatty acids during this process. And then these short-chain fatty acids can be taken up through our gut and used for energy by us. So the bacteria kind of work with us and are able to digest some of these components of plant cell walls that we can't, providing them with energy and providing us with substrates that we can use for energy in our own bodies. Thanks, bacteria. All right, the next organelle that I want to talk about is one that shows up in humans and bacteria, and this is the flagella. The function of the flagella is to aid in cell movement or cell locomotion, and it can also act as a sensory organelle and help the bacteria sense their surroundings. And in terms of location, the flagella is found on the exterior of the cell because it helps that cell move around. And... The human cells that have a flagella are obviously the sperm cells because they need to move up and fertilize the egg in the reproductive tract of the female. And the structure of the flagella depends upon whether it comes from a bacteria or whether it comes from a human cell or a sperm cell. So for bacteria, the flagella is made up of a protein called flagellin. And this flagella has three different components. The first of which is a filament, which is basically this big hollow tube. Then it also has what's known as a hook, which is a curved protein that essentially connects the filament to the third component, which is called a basal body. And the basal body contains the motor that powers the flagella movement. In this case, the basal body rotates and this rotates this filament allowing the bacteria to move. So again, these three components of a bacterial flagella are the filament, the hook, and the basal body, which is like the motor. The sperm flagella, on the other hand, is made up of microtubules. And these microtubules are configured in the 9 plus 2 configuration, where essentially you have these two microtubules in the middle of surrounding nine. So it's like a circle of nine pairs of microtubules around two single microtubules in the center. If you have no idea what the nine plus two configuration is, just Google that real fast and you can kind of see it's just this hollow tube with two individual microtubules in the middle. And that is the structure of the sperm flagella. And with that, I want to move on to the organelle that shows up in humans only and is also my favorite organelle, and that is the mitochondria. And in terms of its function, the phrase you've probably heard a million times is that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, and that is because it produces a majority of the cell's ATP, which the cell uses um, to power reactions. Um, For all of its energy needs, it uses ATP. But the mitochondria does a lot more than that. For instance, it regulates calcium levels in the cell, it generates reactive oxygen species, regulates cell apoptosis, and also is involved in the endoplasmic reticulum stress response. And more recent research has shown that mitochondria can even communicate with each other through intercellular contact. So essentially these mitochondria can kind of line up and touch each other, and then their cristae start to align And you can get these really interesting um, things that go on once these mitochondria begin to communicate. And we don't really know quite what that means yet, but it is something interesting and I think it's an area of ongoing research. 
And it's also important to point out that mitochondria have their own DNA. And in terms of their location, they are located in the cytosol. There's usually a bunch of them spread throughout the cytosol because the cell needs a lot of ATP. And in terms of their structure, these mitochondria are kind of bean-shaped, and they have an outer membrane and an inner membrane. The outer membrane basically forms this bean shape, as I was saying, whereas the inner membrane, which is inside the outer membrane, forms these kind of folds that are known as cristae. Go look up a picture. It looks pretty cool. And inside the inner membrane, you have what is known as the mitochondrial matrix. This is where all the magic happens, um, and it is also where the mitochondrial DNA resides. And one phenomena that is interesting to me and also involves the mitochondria is something that's known as the Warburg effect. And essentially the Warburg effect is an observation made by a scientist, last name Warburg, not sure what his first name is, but he noticed that cancer cells rely on anaerobic metabolism relative to normal cells. So if you remember what anaerobic metabolism is, is it's um, essentially just glycolysis and then you produce lactic acid, and then you re regenerate your NAD or NAD plus or whatever. But essentially, all you're getting out of anaerobic metabolism is 2 ATP. Whereas if you were to go through aerobic metabolism and use the electron transport chain, then you would produce something like 30 ATP. So it's kind of a counterintuitive thing that Warburg noticed. right? Cancer cells, which are proliferating and growing super fast, need a lot of energy, but they rely on anaerobic metabolism, which only produces 2 ATP, whereas if they were using aerobic respiration and the electron transport chain in um, oxidative phosphorylation, then they could produce 30 ATP. And so it's, it's kind of like, what's going on here? And so there's a bunch of different theories as to why it is that cancer cells in particular rely on this anaerobic metabolism pathway. Um, it could be number one, that the cancer somehow impairs mitochondrial function. So then the cell is forced to rely alone on glycolysis and you can only do two ATP at a time. But then there are some theories that say that cancer cells are actually using this Warburg effect to their advantage. One of these theories basically says that during this anaerobic metabolism, you create different substrates that are used by cancer cells to, you know, to make things like nucleotides, lipids, and proteins that are needed by these growing and multiplying cancer cells. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is that the lactic acid that is produced during fermentation actually enhances the tumor invasiveness. So there has been studies that have shown that a low pH tumor environment actually enhances that tumor's invasiveness. So this theory says then that, okay, these cancer cells are using this lactic acid to lower the tumor pH and then increase that cancer's invasiveness. And that is why they don't use the oxidative phosphorylation pathway. Instead, they use the lactic acid fermentation pathway, which is also known as anaerobic metabolism. And of course, this is just two of many, many, many theories to explain the Warburg effect. Um, and I think it's really interesting and something that is probably going to be more and more researched as time goes on. So this is something that you could probably follow during your training as a physician. And um, hopefully this or, or understanding this effect will lead to better treatments and maybe a cure of different types of cancer. All right, so the last cell organelle I want to talk about here um, in terms of cell organelles that are in animal cells only is what's known as the melanosome. And the function of the melanosome is to provide tissues with color and photoprotection. And they are the site of synthesis, storage, and transport of melanin pigments. And again, melanin pigments are what gives your skin color. And these organelles are located in the cytosol of melanocytes, which are mostly found on the skin. And in terms of structure, the melanosome is essentially a pigment vesicle. It's just this lipid bilayer kind of floating around that contains melanin. And an interesting fact about melanin, which again is the pigment produced by the melanosome, is that it has one of the highest refractive indices of any biologically produced material. 
And if you don't remember from the optics podcast what a refractive index is, I recommend that you know what that is for the MCAT. But essentially, the refractive index has to do with how much a material bends light. So melanin is very good at bending light. And I'm guessing this is because it can actually bend UV rays away from um, DNA and therefore protect it from damage. And I'm not really sure that's exactly the function of melanin or, or how melanin provides photo protection. But in theory, as UV light enters and hits a melanin pigment, it's going to bend and maybe bend away from the DNA or bend out of the cell. So kind of cool. All right, the very last cell organelle that I want to talk about in this podcast is an organelle that shows up in plants mostly and is some bacteria. And that organelle is known as the chloroplast. And the function of the chloroplast is to convert light energy into usable energy for plant cells. So it's equivalent to the mitochondria in animal cells. And in terms of their location, they are found all over in the cytosol of the plant cell and can be really all over. They're, they can be kind of mobile and actually, depending on the light that they're exposed to, can kind of move in order to best position themselves to um, be in contact with light. And in terms of their structure, they're actually pretty similar to a mitochondria. They have an outer membrane and an inner membrane. And inside the inner membrane, you have what are known as granulum, which are made of these kind of pancake-looking discs that are known as thylakoids. So again, thylakoids are stacked together to produce granulum, which are inside of the inner membrane of the chloroplast. And of course, as always, I recommend looking up a picture if you don't know what I'm talking about. And like the mitochondria, these chloroplasts have their own DNA. And so that was kind of a very quick, basic overview of the chloroplast. I really wouldn't worry too much about knowing the chloroplast. I think it's much, much more important to know about the mitochondria and some of the other um, more human organelles, just because obviously it's the MCAT and they're going to try to test you more on your knowledge of human biology. And so with that said, this concludes the Cell Organelles podcast. As always, thank you for listening to the Perspective Doctors MCAT Basics podcast. If you felt like this helped you study or you got some good information out of it, please go give us a review on iTunes. Be looking out for a podcast I'm going to do interviewing an MCAT tutor where we talk about cars. And so cars was definitely the hardest topic for me, and I think it is for a lot of other students. And so I wanted to interview somebody who, number one, is good at cars, and number two, understands how to teach cars, because I myself don't really feel like I can give good advice on cars, because I just really never mastered that section. So anyways, I hope that helps. Be looking out for that next week. Thanks for listening to Prospective Doctors MCAT Podcast. If you're a pre-med, you'll want to check out prospectivedoctor.com for tons of free tools, articles, and more podcasts that cover your pre-med life. And if you need help on the MCAT,